Good morning, friends. It is good to be together, scattered throughout Albuquerque and many other homes. So welcome to our 11 o'clock live stream at St. John's United Methodist Church, where we are recording in our beautiful sanctuary surroundings today. Today, um, we begin a new series on resurrection. This is also, being the first Sunday of the month, what we refer to as Family Worship Sunday. So today you will hear a few words from Therese McCauley, our Director of Children and Family Ministry. So gather the family together to hear a few extra words from Therese. And don't forget Parents Club, which meets Monday um, at 7.30 and Wednesday night Bible Club. So you can look on the eDisciple to find out how to connect with those uh, classes by Zoom. Also, Karen Tidler is leading a new Bible study. It's a book by Max Lucado called you get, You'll Get Through This. So she is doing this Tuesday mornings at a, uh, 10 o'clock, 10 to 11, starting this Tuesday, May 5th. And again, look in the eDisciple to find out how to connect with Karen to take that wonderful class. We um, would like to thank you for the wonderful response to the survey that was sent out this past week. As of this morning, we have 287 responses. St. John's leadership team has been meeting weekly through these weeks of COVID-19. We are taking a look at many different factors and ministries of the church and the finances of the church. I'd like to let you know who exactly is on that team. I won't name the names, but the people associated. Your pastors are on that team. We have two of our staff representatives, Matt and Janice. And then we have chairs of committees, the chairs of trustees, finance, SPRC, and the foundation board. We have our church treasurer as part of that team, one of our lay leaders, and our church council chair. So this survey is about gathering information. We are not in a hurry at all, but we want to be prepared when that time comes. So we're looking at different um, phases of, and practical ways and healthy, safe practices. And this is just a way of gathering some information from our congregation. So if you have not yet uh, responded to that survey, we invite you to do so. If you would like to have a hard copy of it, just call Debbie in the church office and we'll make sure to send out a copy of that survey to you. So again, we are looking for information. And we are also in conversation with health professionals that are associated with St. John's. We are looking at CDC recommendations and recommendations of our governors so that we will make best decisions that are safe and healthy for all of us. And friends, today before we begin our time of worship, um, we have a precious, precious soul who has entered into his heavenly kingdom home. This week, our beloved Joe Keith passed into glory. It was um, on Wednesday. What a gift he has been to St. John's and to the community and to the world. And our prayers are with Claudia and the rest of the family and all who love Joe. Let's now take a breath to begin our time of worship.
Would you pray with me? Almighty God, with gladness and thanksgiving, we gather in this space today. We gather to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ as a symbol of your love and a sign of your grace. On this day, we are reminded that you have power over all circumstances in our own lives that may bind us and limit us. O oh God, you answer even before we call. You hear us while we are yet speaking. May all that we say, hear, and do in this hour of worship give honor to your name for the marvelous things you have done in Jesus Christ and in us. We give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you join me in the responsive call to worship? Come, give thanks to our God. God's steadfast love endures forever. God is our strength and might and salvation. God's steadfast love endures forever. Because of this love, we shall not die. This, this is God's doing, and it is marvelous in our lives. This is the day our God has made. Let us rejoice and be glad. Let us state what we believe using the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven, is seated at the right hand of the Father, and will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Would you join me in a time of silence as we go to God to confess our sins? Wondrous God, we confess that at times our doubts and our fears override our hope and our faith. Forgive us when we lose sight of the joy of your love and instead fall into despair and gloom. Lift up our spirits, Lord, and help us to remember the promise of new life, new life here and now, 
not just the hope of resurrection for the future. We give thanks for your Son, Jesus the Christ, who continues to offer us new life, who continues to turn us around and upside down, who continues to break the walls of death in our own life. Forgive us, restore us, and renew us. We ask this in the name of our risen Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Sisters and brothers, hear the good news. The tomb is empty. The stone is rolled away. There is no darkness now, only light. God offers us new life. Our sins are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Hi, everybody, and happy Sunday. This is your family ministry moment. My name is Teresa McCauley. I'm the director of Children and Family Ministries here at St. John's. And I'm so excited Mommy, to- Mommy, can you take this apart? Sorry about that. What I meant to say is that I'm missing all of your faces at church, but I'm so excited Mommy, to- Mommy, can you watch me wiggle my tooth? <sighs> okay, Teresa McCauley. Family ministry moment, take three. Huh. So, I'm gonna talk to you today about the good things that happened from the resurrection. Mommy, can you help us with our homework? Holy tomatoes, guys, oh my goodness. I'm sorry, I hate being interrupted. There is so much work that I have to get done and I have to do the Sunday school stuff. I have to keep all of the parents connected as friends. I play piano, I sing, I'm going to school and I'm being the best mom. And you would think that my kids would know to leave me alone, stop talking and let me continue to work so that I can be the best mom ever. <sighs> sorry, anyway. So I'm here to talk to you about the good things that happened after all of the sad and hard things happened at the crucifixion. So a little backup to this is that Jesus was living in heaven and heaven is perfect. It has everything you want. You want angels singing to you, you got it. You want food to appear magically, it does. And Jesus is a big deal. He is a big deal on earth and he's a big deal in heaven. And those angels did anything that he asked. And then, oh, he was interrupted, wasn't he? He let us interrupt living in heaven so that he could come down, be born in a stinky manger, be beaten and die for our sins. I don't like being interrupted and I don't even live in heaven. I'm in quarantine. Oh, and speaking of quarantine, while you all are here and you have to listen to me, when is this quarantine gonna end? They say it's gonna be done on this date and then they say, oh wait, it's gonna be done on this date. And then that's just like Jesus too. You know, after he died, he could have just gone straight up to heaven. And I bet he could have really used a massage from the angels, but... Okay, so I just really like that sound. But he could have gone back to heaven, but he stayed on earth for another 40 days. And he wasn't even mad about it. He was happy to spend time with his friends a little bit more. He knew that the work that he had to do was so much more important. And he had so much more to teach us. And he wasn't even mad about it. He was happy to see his friends a few more times. I guess I shouldn't be mad about being interrupted either. I'm not the only one stuck in the house and God gave us all important jobs to do, even if it is Legos. I don't know. Pastor Kelly is gonna be sharing with us the important job that the apostles had to do once Jesus went back to heaven and he set everything up for them perfectly. So many good things happened and so many good things are still happening. Here's what the Bible says. 
the apostles were doing many miracles and signs, and everyone felt great respect for God. All the believers stayed together. They shared everything. They sold their land and the things they owned. Then they divided the money and gave it to those people who needed it. The believers met together in the temple every day. They all had the same purpose. They broke bread in their homes, happy to share their food with joyful hearts. They praised God and all the people liked them. More and more people were being saved every day. The Lord was adding those people to the group of believers. Wow, God was blessing their lives. Even though Jesus interrupted what they were doing and he gave them new and important jobs. I guess the bottom line to remember is that good things happen when Jesus interrupts our lives. I'm gonna interrupt this lesson and I'm gonna go apologize to my family. Have a great Sunday, guys. Pastor Kelly has a great message for you and I'll see you all next week. Bye. Thank you for those words of grace, Therese. I'd like to give um, just a brief update on our church finances. We are holding steady. Our April giving was down by about $30,000 from last April, but last April contained an Easter Sunday. Overall, year to date, we are $15,000 over where we were last year at the end of April. So that is a good thing. Um, while many churches are seeing a decline in giving, um, we are holding steady. In fact, I read an article this week that said 62% of churches in the United States are experiencing a, de a decline in giving. So we are so very grateful for your steadfast and faithful giving, continuing to be faithful in giving um, your tithe. And we invite you to consider also along side um, over and beyond extending that giving to social agencies um, of our community such as Roadrunner Food Bank who um, are helping to give so much help to people in great need within the community of Albuquerque. Thank you, thank you for your steadfast and faithful giving.
Let us pray. Holy God, you are the source of all good gifts. Receive these gifts from us. Let them be used to, sh to spread your love, your joy, and your mercy in a hurting world. Amen. Would you join us as together we sing hymn number 421 in the United Methodist hymnal, Make Me a Captive Lord.
In these past few weeks, as I've prayed with you on the phone and in Zoom meetings, I've had a hard time keeping my eyes closed. And so today, I wanted to invite you to leave your eyes open. Maybe look out the window or look into the face of someone you love. Or maybe just rest your eyes on an object that has meaning for you. And as we pray together, with our eyes and our ears and our voices, let us pray with all our heart and with all our mind. For we know that the God who created us created all that we are, body, mind, and spirit. And so we lift our prayers this morning to the Lord, saying, Lord, hear our prayers. Lord, we give you thanks for your peace that passes all understanding, for your loving kindness and for the salvation of our souls. Lord, hear our prayers. We pray for the peace of the world, the well-being of all people, the unity of the church, and for this life of resurrection that you have given us. Lord, hear our prayer. Lord, we pray for all students who are not able to attend their schools right now, not able to be with friends, to take part in activities that they enjoy. Be with them. Deliver them from loss of interest or lack of concern and open their hearts to new possibilities, to joy and to awe. For parents who are at work or working from home or maybe who have lost their jobs, keep us from despair, dear Lord. Deliver us from a lack of concern or interest. And for ourselves, create within us strong connections to you and to each other by the power of your Holy Spirit. Lord, hear our prayers. We thank you for the people of this congregation and this community, our neighbors, friends, and acquaintances, everyone, people who live alone, people who live together, for children, young people, and all those wise people who have a wider perspective than our own. Lord, we pray for the sense of the gifts of time and patience in this moment. And we also pray for any and for all who are impatient in these days. Help us to bear one another's burdens, to remember that you are slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. Lord, hear our prayers. We thank you for the kindness and compassion shared by people who continue to work at the grocery store and the hardware store, at clinics and hospitals, for all of those who serve and protect police and firefighters, those whose services in the cities we could not do without, who tend our common good. We pray for their safety and health in the face of this pandemic. Give them strength give them rest, be with them to combat their fears and protect them in what they do on our behalf. Lord, hear our prayers for the leaders of all nations, all people in authority, that they may receive your wisdom and be engaged in cooperation, human rights, and goodwill for all. Lord, hear our prayer for this beautiful gift of creation. Give to us, Lord, a growing compassion for the earth that we may put into practice your wisdom and your will for its care and conservation, and we might see how you are making all things new in it and through it. Lord, hear our prayer. For those in this congregation and in our families who are suffering in body, mind, or spirit, we lift up to you their names now, O oh Lord, our great physician. For all of those who have died in the hope of the resurrection and for all the departed, for those that mourn and those that weep, Lord, hear our prayers. 
deliver us from violence and danger and hardness of heart and anything that separates us one from another. Defend us, deliver us, and in your compassion, protect us by your grace. And now we join our voices to the one who lives among us and who teaches us to live in reverent prayer and praise. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The reading this morning is from Acts, the second chapter, verses 42 to 47. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. Awe came upon everyone because many wonders and signs were being done by the apostles. All who believed were together and held all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all as any had need. Day by day, as they spent much time together in the temple, they broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having the good will of all people. And day by day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. The word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. This week, my teacher, Stanley Hauerwas, was interviewed and reminded those who were watching that the real new normal, the true disruption, has already happened in the resurrection. And now that we've had 2,000 years or so of attempting to understand it and to try to live into it faithfully, we continue to recite, on the third day he rose from the dead. And in doing that, we are practicing the kerygma, telling the story, proclaiming a truth, that there is a life beyond this existence, and it is infused into our lives now, resurrection. Over the next three, three weeks, we will hear from some of the gifted storytellers of this congregation, ministers all. They will remind us again of the power of the resurrection and how we are called to practice it day by day, just as Luke tells us. He begins in this passage saying, they devoted themselves it tells us something about what it looks like when people have been sideswiped by the Holy Spirit. They have gathered as the first converts to welcome this message of Jesus risen from the dead. And they have heard, I suspect, or maybe been eyewitnesses to the Spirit descending upon them like the sound of a rushing violent wind. This is a snapshot of people who are trying to practice resurrection. It took time. They devoted themselves, listening to one another, sharing the teachings of the resurrections, tuning in, if you will, to gratitude, relinquishing their belongings, committing to being together, praying and sharing meals with glad and generous hearts so that their lives began to take the shape and the form of the life of their Savior. Luke is telling us that the power of the triune God, a power that transforms everything we thought we knew, can look like people devoting themselves to paying attention to one another to discernment. And all of this is happening in the wake of the suffering and the death and the resurrection. They are trying to come to terms with what it means to be knocked out by the grace of God, even to be terrified by seeing 
their risen Savior. Practicing resurrection, it seems, can look like getting knocked down seven times and getting back up eight. To stand up again by the grace and the love and the humility of Jesus. What will we devote ourselves and our lives to, dear friends? Might we hear this story as an invitation to a way of being that already has begun and is ongoing, unfolding even now, for we, you and I, are in the flow of this story, and it is a story that is intended to set us free, free from the anxiousness of the day, that might just leave us, as Charles Wesley writes, lost in wonder, love, and praise. Acts reminds us that we have been given a life in Christ, that creates a belonging that we could not ask or imagine. It's why we don't believe that we pulled ourselves up from our own bootstraps. The gift of this life is a resurrected life. It comes from God. It is derived. It does not originate with us. We did not invent this story. Luke is also painting a picture of koinonia. He is sharing with us the image of a people who are sharing stories like bread. A good story can go a long way, can't it? Koinonia is that possibility of both community and economy and spirit that comes together by the grace of God, a life for the long view, a circuitous way a gift for a lifetime. And it has come all the way down to us. We are to understand ourselves as a people who share in this life of Christ and who tell stories of what God has done for us to keep us grounded, to remind us who we are and whose we are. And so we tell stories too, and I am particularly grateful this week for those of you who have shared stories of faith with me, who have Zoomed or called or texted or sung wonderful words of life, engaging me in a world that is so rich in meaning and purpose and possibility that it does fill me with awe. Your stories have helped me live my daily life and to name it a life in Christ day by day. It tells of a kind of stubborn hope, a life that is open-ended and lives with questions and doesn't have all the answers, that somehow embraces doubt, lives with sorrow, and is teaching us, you and I, how to enjoy the days and to attempt to live faithfully. For many of us at St. John's, the loss of fellowship is painful, and we are keenly aware of the separation. For me, although the technology can somewhat mediate the distance, it also has this peculiar effect of increasing a sense of longing for bodily gathering. When I see us gathered electronically, somehow there's a space within me that's opened up in brokenness, yearning for physical presence, a deep place, a deep place that wants to believe in resurrection and to see it in action. This week, during the online Coffee with Pastors, I shared a picture that you will see on your screens. This bowl is an example of kintsuki. It is the Japanese art of putting broken pottery pieces back together with gold. It's built on the idea that even in brokenness there is hope and possibility. Through this work, the artist creates an even stronger and more beautiful piece of art. Every break is unique. And instead of repairing it like new, this 400-year-old technique actually highlights the scars as a part of its design. 
I think of it as a metaphor for how God in Christ has healed us, a way in which God is making things new and beautiful and resilient. Resurrection helps us tell those stories, share our scars, remember our healing, and points us toward the beauty that is life in Christ. It whispers to us that there is another truth, a reality that is that nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, not one thing. That's why I tell the story. When we can't think of a way forward, when we can't follow this linear path that we are on and it has fallen apart, and the narrative we have told ourselves about who we thought we were is crashing around us, we circle back to the old, old story of the one who created us, who gathers us, who lives among us and restores us still, still, reminding us that nothing is lost, waking us up to the presence of the living God, even in places of despair and grief. Resurrection is movement from death to life, a life that bears witness to the scars and the cracks and the brokenness and the interconnectedness of all things, and to a God who overcomes, who makes a way where there is no way. This, friends, is not the story of a community that is on a fast track to economic well-being. It is not a story that is giving us an example of how to get ahead and succeed in five easy steps. No, thank God. Instead, we are telling and hearing and living into a story that shows us how to live as people who are given time to be God's people. People who listen to one another, who struggle to believe and even doubt sometimes what they are seeing. A story of how ordinary people, like the disciples, like you and I, became the church. A pe people empowered by the Spirit and emboldened, even bewildered by the resurrection, who began to share their journey together beyond doubt, through fear, through loss, and even in the midst of suffering. It is a crazy kind of hope. This is our story. This is us, living into the patient and curious hope of the resurrection. May we, you and I, be given the grace to trust it and to live into it. Amen. During this time of sheltering in place, we have an opportunity for Sabbath rest. We have been talking about that very thing over these past weeks. We also have an opportunity as disciples of Jesus Christ to invite ourselves to look for the risen Lord around us and within us. And this week as an invitation to discipleship, um, I invite us to consider several questions. Maybe we will want to journal on these questions. Maybe we will simply want to sit in quiet space and consider them. I'm asking us to consider through this period of time what are we learning about ourselves? What are we learning about ourselves? And how are we experiencing resurrection in our personal lives? And what is our personal story of resurrection? So again, I invite you to ponder those questions and to sit in quiet space to invite the resurrected Lord 
Spirit's presence around us and within us. And now let us prepare to sing together. Hear this word of benediction. O oh Lord, disrupt our lives. Lead us to the practice of resurrection with patience and with passion. Amen. <laughs> 